No, I've lost you. So I'm so thrilled uh, that Rochelle Gutierrez is uh, closing us out today, closing out our ShadowCon. Uh, Rochelle is a tireless and tenacious uh, advocate for uh, equitable math instruction for Latina, Latino, and black students, and also for their teachers, which is a fact that I, I knew in the abstract from having read her work and of her reputation. Uh, it was a, a real treat to know it concretely, though, at her Iris Carl address recently, where I saw uh, just a, a line of teachers, like almost out the door, uh, there for the usual selfies, yes, but uh, also it just seemed for words of comfort and strategic, strategic advice for working in oppressive conditions. And so I'm just so grateful she's here offering her insight to all of us. Please welcome up Rochelle. <laughs> Buenas noches. Ah, is my mic on? Buenas noches. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit more um, lenient than Kanika was, and I'm going to give you 29 seconds to turn to your person. I, I want you to think hard right now. Who in your building is not being served well? Think maybe there's a particular student you have in mind. Maybe there's a group of students you have in mind. And be asking yourself as you discuss with the person next to you, what's keeping them or who is keeping them from being able to have meaningful learning or advancement. 29 seconds. 51, 52, 53, 54, 55. I knew you weren't going to listen to me if I said 55 in the beginning, so I figured I'd set the bar low, let you go along. Uh, so when, you think about, when you think about who or what that was, you might feel like there's some things that are in our own control. Maybe the things that are in our own classroom, we may be unwittingly preventing our own students from having meaningful um, learning. And we can think about some of the things like, what are our relationships with students? What kinds of norms do we set in our classrooms? How we cover our curriculum or attend to pacing schedules? The differentiation or our assessments? But maybe we may feel like most of the things that are preventing students from having meaningful learning are happening elsewhere. They're happening outside our classroom. There are things like high stakes testing, te new textbook series that are adopted, Tracking and sorting, as in how do we place kids in groups. Maybe it's administrators, colleagues, or parents who have deficit views about our kids, right? So maybe they feel like those are things that are out of our control. But are they really? Maybe they're only out of our control if we think of teaching as the thing that is within our classroom. But if we think about teaching as a profession, we think about what happens outside of the classroom and how we might actually influence those things outside of the classroom, it opens doors for us to think about things in a different way. So is it really just all these deficit views of colleagues or testing regimes, new teacher evaluation systems that are keeping us from uh, serving all of our students well? Maybe it's our view about mathematics. Maybe there's something about how we think about mathematics that's actually affecting uh, the kinds of ways that we can support students. We get a lot of privilege from teaching mathematics. You all know that every time you say you're a math teacher, you get two responses. One response is, I was never any good at math. And the other response is, wow, you must be smart, right? Now, I think the question is, do we challenge that? Do we challenge that privilege that we get when people have that response. And I think you can learn a lot about how we think about our profession by the stories that we tell. So why is it that this story gets told? Can people in the back read it? Need me to read it? OK. Uh, sociologist is down there saying nothing. Psychologist is up, up next. Sociology is just applied psychology. The biologist says psychology is just applied biology. Chemist says biology is just applied chemistry. Physicist says, which is just applied physics. It's nice to be on top. And then you've got mathematicians down there on the end. Oh, oh, hey, I didn't see you guys all the way down there. So math is purity. And why is this story told? My students drew me into another political argument. Yeah, it happens. Lately, political debates bother me. They just show how good people are at rationalizing. This is all being said in the teacher's lounge. The world is so complicated. The more I learn, the less clear anything gets. There are too many ideas and arguments to pick and choose from. How can I trust myself to know the truth about anything? And if everything I know is so shaky, what on earth am I doing teaching? Well, I guess you just do the best you can. No one can impart perfect universal truths to their students. <clears throat> well, except math teachers. Thank you. Why are those stories told? And why isn't this story told, where mathematics is a religion? So Calvin starts out, you know, I don't think math is a science. I think it's a religion, 
a religion? Yeah, all these equations are like miracles. You take two numbers, and when you add them together, they magically become one new number. No one can say how it happens. You either believe it or you don't. This whole book is full of things that have to be accepted on faith. It's a religion. And in the public schools, no less. Call a lawyer. Well, as a math atheist, I should be excused from this. <laughs> so we may ask ourselves, what are the stories that we tell, and in what way do those stories continue to affect how students feel? For many students, math the mathematics classroom feels like this. Go along with the labels and categories that we've placed you in. Buy into a product. Now that product may feel like, but it's mathematics. It's this beautiful bubble that we all love, and it's, if they could just see it the way we see it. But for many students, it feels like it's already been discovered. It's this static thing. I basically just have to consume it. We may ask, students may feel like we ask them to just leave their cultures, their language, their emotions, and their bodies outside of the classroom. Ask yourself, when was the last time you required students to use their bodies to do mathematics? And for a lot of students, it also feels like just pretend. Just pretend this is real world. Even though students may feel like this doesn't look like anything that's in my real world. And that's where we get that question. When are we ever going to use this? Now, the question of when are we ever going to use this has already been asked by that person many times. In their head, they've already said, when am I going to use this? When are we going to use this comes up when they're basically asking everyone else in the room to recognize and to comment on the fact that the emperor is not wearing any clothes. We ask them to learn mathematics to be powerful. And maybe the sub-message is, so then if you don't learn mathematics, you're not going to be a powerful person in society. I would argue that all mathematics teachers are identity workers. We all contribute to the kinds of identities that students develop, both in our classrooms and long into life. So when you think about those reactions you get from people when you say you're a math teacher, that's been carried with them into their lives. We also are part and parcel helping reproduce what mathematics is and how people are able to relate through it as an activity. So I have 10 things I think every educator should know about mathematics. Uh, the first is that modern mathematics is relatively young. And I say, yes, modern mathematics, right? That's what we're using, only one small version of mathematics. It's relatively young, which means it's tentative, it's fallible, and it's evolving. Mathematics superiority to other disciplines has no basis. It operates with unearned privilege in society in the same way that whiteness does. So we can have a society where intelligence is not based on your ability to do abstraction, on your ability to reason mathematically. Or we, we could instead have a, a society that's built on you being smart if you are artistic or if you think holistically. But we don't have that right now. There's not one mathematics, there are many. And many of those mathematics have been ignored, devalued, or outright distorted. I encourage you to look into ethnomathematics if it feels like you can't understand that, that part of it. And I say mathematics is a verb, it's not a noun. Mathematics is this activity. It needs humans to do mathematics. It isn't this thing that's just out there. But mathematics has justified social inequalities as natural when they're not. That is, it has, by, through, the, through measuring, through sorting, through quantifying, uh, it has allowed us to say, for example, uh, that somebody who's in the STEM field should get paid way more than somebody who's a musician. When it comes to the achievement gap, there's more variation within groups than between them. So I think a lot of people forget the fact that if we look at the achievement gap as our, as our kind of means to thinking about equity, it's really a bimodal distribution. So you have two big peaks that overlap, two big humps that overlap. And you are, we're fascinated with the, with the distance between those two peaks and not in the distance that's the spread of any one of those groups. There are many achievement gaps that we could look at that we don't. We could look at the white Asian achievement gap. Mathematics ability is not real, but the trauma associated with it is. I liken this to the fact that race is a social construct, right? There's no such thing as race, but there are material consequences for racism in our society. All mathematics teachers are identity workers. I've said that before. And it's not just that people need mathematics. Mathematics needs people. Oftentimes, when we frame equity arguments, we say these populations need access into this STEM pipeline, and we think that that's what equity should be about. But that's really a deficit perspective on all students. Instead, we should be saying we need different people 
to participate in mathematics, people who haven't historically participated in mathematics, because they're going to ask different questions. They're going to participate and want to use mathematics in different ways, and that's going to make mathematics change. That's going to make mathematics more vibrant. And the last is that we can rehumanize mathematics through the everyday ways in which we talk about and carry out our work. Oop. Teaching mathematics is political. I say it's because every day we make in the moment decisions that affect students not just in the classroom but long into their lives. We overhear others talking about our students, labeling them or creating policies that will affect them. And we ourselves, we carry out assessments that will tell them something about themselves. Not just something about what they've learned, but also something about their value and their worth in this society. So we face attention. On the one hand, we love our students and we want what's best for them. On the other hand, as professionals, we want to follow school policies and practices, but they aren't necessarily in the best interest of students. So what do we do? Well, if we want to stand up to a policy or a practice or a deficit comment that a colleague has made, it's not going to be easy. But you're not alone. There are a lot of organizations out there that are providing resources and activities and information and networking for you to reach out with. For example, the Todos um, Mathematics for All group has created a position statement that I encourage you to look at. It's a joint position statement with the National Council of, of um, Supervisors of Mathematics. So what if we located the thing that was keeping students from learning in our own practice? It's April. It's almost the end of the year. My norms are set. What can I do? Well, I encourage us to think about creative ways. Maybe we create an exit ticket that lets students tell you about how your class is working. Maybe we position a problem student as an expert on something that we wouldn't otherwise. Maybe we ask students to invent a new algorithm. And maybe what we've previously thought of as a problem student has a really creative way of thinking about things. Maybe we incorporate an activity or practice that can rehumanize mathematics. Maybe it's something in social justice mathematics. And there's some other suggestions that are here. So again, what if these things are outside of your classroom and you're thinking, how do I stand up? My parents, you're thinking to yourself, my parents raised me to be a good-mannered, respectful, nice person. And I like the fact that right now the people in the building like me. And you're maybe thinking, I'm not an activist. I'm not a troublemaker. I'm not good at confrontations. Or maybe I'm just not even the kind of person people listen to. But some of the things that you could do if these things feel like they're outside of your classroom are to engage in dialogue, engage in what if brainstorming. What if we positioned more of our emergent bilinguals as experts in our building? And I use that term very purposefully, emergent bilingual. I want you to think about the fact that when we say English learner, we're using English as our standard by which we are judging people. And we are saying that they lack English. When we say emergent bilingual, we are already validating, recognizing they have something they already have, and they're emerging into having two languages more fully. You could turn a rational issue into a moral one. Maybe all of your evidence and your suggestions of why you should do things differently fall on deaf ears. And maybe it's at a point where you just have to say, regardless of what the data say, regardless of what the district is saying, regardless of what we've done in the past, is this really what we want to stand for as a department or as a team or as a, as a building? Is this the legacy we want to leave that we look at our calculus class and we say, we don't have any black students in our calculus class, and that's been a pattern for the past 10 years. I've given some other suggestions. Maybe you find an article or a blog. Maybe you write to your district, or you write into the op-ed section of your paper. Or maybe you raise the issue at a department or a team meeting, or suggest a book that you might all read together. You may feel like, even when there's things you don't like that are happening in your building, they're familiar, right? So kind of going along with what everybody else is doing is just easier. And you may be asking yourself, well, if I want to stand up for students, the part you may be focusing on is, what if I fail? I think the part that you should be thinking about is, what if I do nothing? And maybe more importantly, what if I succeed? So I remind you that students do not have the luxury of leaving the conversation if decisions are being made about them and it gets uncomfortable. And maybe we shouldn't either. Every time I start to worry about or get scared about speaking up and thinking I might lose something, I, I have to remind myself, be comforted in the fact that I can look myself in the mirror and say, I'm doing what I said I was going to do when I entered this profession. And part of that is reminding myself that I cannot be the teacher if I do not perceive with even greater clarity that my practice demands of me a definition of where I stand, a break with what is not right ethically. 
So my call to action is this. Identify something that's keeping students from meaningful learning or advancement. And pick particular students in your building. Try not to think about like your entire building. Find one or two other people in your building and strategize. What's one thing you can do? And maybe that thing you do collectively, or maybe you do it individually. But you're going to stand up for those students. Then reconvene and report back on how it went, and post on Twitter what or who you stood up for. Now, I was raised in an activist family. My mother's here. And uh, part, of, part of understanding action is being part of a social movement. It's not about you. It's about something larger. And part of taking action is announcing publicly that you plan to take action. So I encourage you now that if you plan to stand up for students, I encourage you to stand now. Thank you.